Okay, uh, welcome everybody. We are gonna be talking about growing the market and increasing enjoyment for TV sport. And uh, I've got an uh, august panel to discuss this, the subject. I'm gonna each ask each of my panelists to introduce themselves and to answer our opening question about how do we go about maximizing reach and monetization in sports? So why don't we start all the way on the end there with you, Ashwin. Sure, um, Ashwin Desai, I look after digital distribution at um, Formula One. Um, that's all distribution um, on digital platforms um, through broadcasters, through social media platforms, um, as well as a range of kind of tertiary rights, audio, podcasting, esports media, photography, data distribution um, among them. Uh, in terms of maximizing, it's an awfully big question. <laughs> that's, a, that's, the, um, that's the business we're in. Um, I think it varies significantly market by market. Um, I think uh, there are trends which of course everyone in this room is very familiar with um, in more mature markets, obviously increasing digital distribution, more time spent on digital from a consumer perspective, um, which means that that kind of the reach revenue equation obviously is, is changing a little bit. Um, but I think it, it yeah, it, it varies, it varies of course too, too much on a market by market basis probably. Now for you, mm. you, you have a very large footprint in traditional mm. broadcast and you also have the F1 app. Yeah. So talk a little bit about the balance then. Yeah, sure. So the F1 app is a, a core, a hardcore fan proposition. So we don't see it as in any way cannibalistic of the core broadcast offering. Um, you know, it, it does very well. Netherlands is a great example where we're, we're of course, with Viaplay in the market, uh, core rights. Um, we also run F1 TV. Both products are doing tremendously well. Um, and I think that's, that's what we see really on a, on a global basis, wherever we have the F1 TV Pro offering um, live. I think what, what we do see is we, we are best placed as, a, as kind of the, the guardian, the caretaker of the sport to present that kind of hardcore fan proposition. Um, you know, over 20 feeds, all the, the data, um, you know, multiple languages, uh, a kind of a level of sophistication and detail that um, our core audience expects, um, but which in many cases broadcasters um, aren't able to deliver against. So I think we see them as quite, quite different propositions, but um, you know, both really valuable and reaching quite different audiences. Very good, very good. So I'll come back to you, Joe. Let's go to Simon next. Hi. Introduce yourself yeah. and uh, how do we go? I think I, I, think I know you, how you're gonna suggest we maximize the value. No, no, no. <laughs> um, my name's Simon Bryden. I'm the Senior Director for Sports Rights Anti-Piracy at Cinemedia. I've been in the OTT world before OTT had been invented. I created an internet broadcast channel in 2002, which I sold in 2007, called Cycling Television. So I've been delivering content, selling and managing sports rights for uh, 20 years in uh, all forms of media. And the bottom line is we live in a golden age of television, an amazing time. For some of us, and I think there's a few out there who might have been in the same boat, but for those of us who grew up in watching television in the 70s with literally three channels and poor picture quality, to think what is available now and the quality of what is available and the pressure on the consumer of what they're going to watch, where they're going to watch it, how they're going to watch it, there is only one way to, uh, to grow and maximize your content and that is to have really good content. And then if you do have really good content, uh, someone's gonna steal it, and that is where we now come in. But you've just got to have high quality, top quality content. And give us, a, give us an idea of the dimensions of the stealing, particularly in sport. It's, it's a high value target, right? Well, it's not, not just sport because a lot of the services that we deal with, and we are the biggest provider of security solutions, uh, we do conditional access from the old days from Sky, <coughs> E-In, et cetera, to the new world of OTT where it's extremely easy to steal content. And these professional criminals will aggregate everything, the entire works of live sport, Hollywood studios, Netflix, everything. And they're just offering a replacement service, be it on closed network, IPTV networks, or open web. And with so much pressure on uh, the wallet and the multitude of services that you need to buy, clearly if you can get everything ever made in the world, live, uh, VOD, etc., 
for $10, $15, 10 pounds a month. It's a really attractive proposition. And because OTT is so easy to deliver and at quality, even illegally, it's a very, very, very profitable business model that costs the sports industry, from you just heard me now from Ampere interviewing Peter Parmenter, Meenal and Ampere carried out research for us and we interviewed pirate consumers all over the world and the loss to the sports industry alone of the convertible value is over $28 billion a year. It, it seems like you may not even be aware that you're using an illegal service, right? Uh, I think most people know they're using an illegal service. We have a client who has had a call to his customer service department complaining that their service wasn't working when they finally worked out they were using an illegal service, but that is a, a, a rare uh, occurrence. But these people are managing their budget and they're stealing and pirating uh, because uh, it is a variety of reasons from price, cost, accessibility, you know, no distribution in their market. There's a whole host of reasons. But the most important thing is that 74% of people who were surveyed, uh, illegal content users, 74% also have a legal service. So the pirate consumer is on the whole a consumer also of legal content and paid legal content. So there's a multitude of issues for why they pirate. Um, but yeah, it's just so easy. Yeah, yeah. Um, Joe, Me again. I think you need to introduce yourself, but let's talk about maximizing the value. I, uh, well, you touched on it there, which is, um, I think it's about rep delivering a mix. One of the words that you mentioned as well was making it easy for consumers. So whether it's behind a paywall, behind a direct to consumer wall, paid still, or free, you know, taking the barrier away from someone who might want to engage because they're a core enthusiast, or uh, lightly engage because they've seen something that's perked their interest, making that barrier really low and free is pretty a pretty great way to make it a low barrier, uh, I think is a key element to expanding the reach. Um, it also combats piracy, right, from the free perspective, right? It's easier to take it for free than pirate it. Yeah. Um, but that's not to say that I would take away from the, the pay deals. They, for the most part, pay for the sports, um, but they don't do a phenomenal amount to fill the funnel of a new audience, right? The right. new audience tends to not want to pay. They do, but um, one of the one of the questions for you, Simon, is um, when I th when I think about probably one of the triggers for somebody looking for pirated content is not being able to find the content in the first place, free or or for pay. Um, am I right in that assumption? Uh, it is a trigger, of course. There are uh, such a plethora of uh, channels and OTT channels, so knowledge of where to find something. You know, lots of people aren't aware suddenly a Premier League package comes up on an Amazon or whatever. But, you know, it is fairly easy in the digital world to find where it can be. Another issue is dark market exploitation. You know, some people can't sell in certain markets or aren't able to get a broadcast deal. So obviously uh, in those dark markets, the people are left with no option but to try and pirate. So. One way is for uh, rights owners to uh, work on their distribution models, and I'm sure uh, Ashwin or <laughs> whatever will, will have models where in certain markets they're distributing direct, uh, where they don't have a broadcast deal or a hybrid deal. So yeah, one, one way to avert that trigger is for the rights owners to work on their distribution models. Yeah, yeah. A Ashwin, one of the things that you mentioned about the F1 app is that you're really looking, this is, a, this is a, 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 for a hardcore fan or not a super fan maybe of the sport. Talk to us about how you're improving the experience for that fan with the F1 app. Yeah, sure. So, so F1 is quite a unique sport in that, of course, broadcasters historically have gotten a kind of world feed that is, you know, a, a fully produced, a feed that's produced by F1 that um, showcases, you know, the, the most relevant action as we see it from a an overall kind of championship standpoint, if you like. Um, at, at the same time, there are of course uh, many other drivers on the on the grid on the track at the same time. So you know, most actual feature two or three cars. There are another seventeen there, 
um, that have uh, you know, their, own, their own team and driver followings. Um, the F1 TV Pro app uh, allows you to follow any of those drivers. It has onboard cams from all 20 drivers. Um, it has a, a data feed, a new pit lane channel. It has various additional commentary feeds with different languages. Um, we'll be experimenting with um, kind of uh, some original comms there too um, that is uh, produced by F1. Um, it gives you access to all the telemetry that's within the kind of live timing app um, that we've had in the market for a long time. So it, it really super serves, I think, the fan, for both from a, a primary screen experience perspective, um, but also with the live timing product, um, uh, with, with the second screen experience as well. So how do, how do you typically see those super fans using the app? Is it just on race day or are they using it? You know, throughout. Yeah, it's interesting. So the the bulk of engagement is is live. Um, so you will see a lot of fans, um, you know, say in the Netherlands, uh, having kind of shooting up the world feed as well as Max Verstappen's onboard cam, as you'd expect. Um, but actually, in certain markets, and I think it is kind of the more avid markets uh, across our footprint, you do also see a lot of VOD consumption. So the content, you know, while while live is really the focus of the proposition. Um, there's about 2,000 hours of archive programming. Um, there are features, there's shoulder programming during the race week that you know, we don't see as, as core to the proposition in the way it would be for a, a VOD or general entertainment service. But um, for that audience that wants just, just a bit more, I think, I think it, it clearly is, is utilized. And, and how do you view, it's come up a couple of times, the Netflix docuseries. How do you view that? That's a, you know, it's brought a ton of new people into the sport. I mean, you go to, you go to the US uh, five years ago, for, for many people, F1 was very much a, you know, almost an unknown entity, I think, outside of certain um, you know, major cities like, uh, like Austin or whatever. But I think now it's, it's delivered us a degree of ubiquity, I think, there that, is, that I, I've never seen before. And, and, and really, um, it's coming out the back of the pandemic, I think, really the last six to eight, maybe 10 months. Um, there's been a really material shift, I think, in the perception of the sport there. Um, and um, as you'd expect, that's reflecting itself across, across the business, whether that's in our, our media rights conversations, our sponsor conversations, licensees, um, everyone's kind of seeing the uplift in the territory. Yeah, yeah. Um, Joe, experience, is that something that you're beginning to think about now that you've got your footprint with, uh, with, with Linear? Are you beginning to think about how you can help actually drive experience as well? Yeah, so you know, if you spend money on acquiring somebody to your service, you've got to do a damn good job of making the most out of them when they're got there. Got to keep them there, right? Yeah, um, the bar is set pretty high by a lot of the other people in the OTT space. Uh, people have an expectation that's set by Netflix for a user experience. Yep. So that's, that's the kind of gold standard in industry, get to that. There are others that are not that. Um, we're en route, you know, classic startup. We have to start somewhere um, and start with the most critical pieces of our product. Um, but it's, it's extending that user journey and it's making sure that when they fall out of the thing that ended, that sport piece that they yeah. stopped watching, they fall into something that extends that watch time um, and making that journey seamless. As, as so you're really, you're really helping the rights holders program their channel, advising them on, on how to program that channel to maximize uh, engagement? To the extent that you know, we have a bearing from the UK on some of these channels that are scheduled from yep. the US, we do. Um, the good thing is it's less set in stone than say traditional linear scheduling is, right? You can have a far higher degree of accuracy of who's watching at any given point in time, Yep, um, that's for sure. Um, and less, I would say, or at least less of a traditional focus on how things should be in a schedule, as opposed to, you know, let's try to see what, let's see what works if we try this. Right. Uh, Simon, um, I'm wondering with one of the, is one of the reasons do you think that premium sports are sticking with traditional delivery because there is hesitancy about the security of delivery online? Uh, the organized criminal will get their content regardless of uh, where it is delivered. There is a big benefit for them to steal it from the OTT service because every OTT service in the world is vulnerable to being hacked on its control plane or from its CDN. So if you are a criminal and you can hack the, and they can, every uh, 
OTT platform, you can steal the content straight from the CDN, which gives you uh, the ability to deliver the feeds directly to your illegal viewers, not only illegally, free of charge, but also at the expense of the rightful rights owner who is paying the technical delivery costs for that content. So they do like to get a hold of the content from the OTT platform, and the first thing the OTT services need to do is lock that door, and it, DRM is not the way to do that. That will not protect your OTT service, but um, I can tell anyone if they want to how to do it, but later. Um, so they will get it that way, but they will also be set up with pirate laboratories, aggregating all that content, and those content aggregators will sell it uh, to multitudes of illegal wholesalers. Those wholesalers that will then distribute it to multiple hundreds of thousands of resellers across open and IPTV networks. So they will get the content regardless of how. The job of the rights owner or the broadcaster is to make that as difficult as possible. And if you do that, it does work. If you make it really hard, you drive up the cost of delivery, you drive up the inconvenience, you drive a whole... So you, you can drive certain businesses out of business because as the cost of aggregating it goes up, the cost of distributing it by the pirate goes up and resellers will drop out of the market because it gets too expensive. So that is one way to do it. And then the other way is to take the best effective action to remove your content. If you do it properly, we talked about the pirate consumer does buy legal content. You as the broadcaster and the rights owner have to make sure that you are doing everything. So it's not you that is the price victim. They're going to be seeking and they're going to be pirating the content elsewhere and they'll take their legal spend to the one who does the best job at protecting their content. Right. Uh, Ashwin, when you think about from the perspective of you're still fundamentally invested in broadcast and, and pay TV delivery of, of the content. When you, when you look at digital delivery for the live feeds, are there any other factors that keep you in the broadcast camp for the delivery of the live rather than straight digital delivery through, through the F1 app? I, don't, I wouldn't say we're in the kind of this, the, the straight broadcast camp, if you like. I mean, it isn't as black as white as that anymore. Most of our broadcast partners have digital platforms of their own. So they're um, simulcasting already in digital exactly, the content. Exactly, yep. um, typically simulcasting. I mean, some could deploy other strategies in particular markets. But um, I mean, for us, it's critical that those partners are really heavily invested in digital. Um, you know, as we move to pay TV in markets, we look at, you know, as Joe's kind of alluded to, the, the overall media mix, if you like, the overall conversation around the sport. Um, some of those pay TV partners have, um, you know, smaller linear viewing uh, audiences, but at the same time, significant digital scale, you know, massive social media platforms, um, significant digital news publishing platforms that are driving, you know, a very material conversation around the sport in those territories and a local conversation around the sport that, that we, of course, don't do through our own channels. So um, I'd say we're not, we're not strictly in one camp or the other. I think we've, you know, we recently partnered with Viaplay that's a pure play digital platform. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I can see us doing so in the future in, in other markets too. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that that is the view from us. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I want to do a quick fire round and just each of you ask each of you to speculate which will be the first premium sport that goes digital first. Which do you think will go digital first? Uh, who, who do you think will, which, which premium sport will go digital first? So why don't we start with you, Joe? Uh, well, I'd probably say this one here, to be honest with you. <laughs> Only because I'm a big Formula One fan um, and a lot's changed since the, the Bernie era. Um, yeah, I, yeah, there's a lot of other sports that are really heavily wed to that you know, traditional distribution means. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's going to come anytime soon, that's no. for sure, for anyone. I don't know if you want to tell me. Simon, um, what do you I, think? I might argue, we've just heard from Pete Parmenter, Serie A is digital first. It's the zone. It's, it's an OTT play. They have, by regulatory rules in Italy, to stand up a, a channel on satellite. They have to, but it, it, DAZN have sold to a, an OTT player. They are 
digital first, 100%. And Pete talked about all the problems of digital and the Italian authorities are all over that. Luckily, not what I do in security, but our Cinemedia Edge CDN is top performing Edge CDN delivering uh, that content. Uh, so it's there, it's happened. Anybody but anybody else after Syria? Uh, another example, I think, is the, the IPL, right? The, um, like significant digital distribution in its core market. It's already um, very, very heavily invested yeah, in digital. Uh, exactly. So I think I think we're already there. I think, and you know, we've we've of course gone digital first in, in Netherlands, as I, as I mentioned. Um, there are other territories where I, I expect we might we might do similar. So um, yeah, it's happening. I even have an, an issue with sort of digital and broadcasting. I just it's all the same thing. It doesn't matter. We're all just on screens. I thought, you know, we'd, we'd stop talking about broadcast, traditional and digital this. It's just screens, how you get the content there. And then at the end of the day, money. Who, who's got the best financial deal for someone like, for, for Ashwin and Formula One, it, it's who's got the best deal. We'll work out the finesse around the, you know, the free to air or the promotional side or what do we need to do. But it, it's, it's the money that talks and it's uh, the, the, the platforms will follow uh, depending on who's got the most money. So you don't see any other factors preventing premium sports from, from going digital first? Uh, the only thing, and we, Pete talked a lot about that, is capacity of the ISPs to deliver the scale of what they're having to do in a live environment for live sport. The networks are stressed and uh, you know, a lot of what we do on the back end of other technology is about delivering that, helping deliver that service. But uh, it, you know, we're seeing Amazon uh, you know, with a Premier League package, uh, pure digital, there is nothing except there's platform pure digital. Uh, so that is one issue, the volume at some point of the internet to manage the capacity and the ISPs to keep up with demand. So um, one of the things that I've noticed is happening a lot now in virtual linear, and maybe I should, I should ask you to go first on this, show, is that there's a lot of scheduling of live now in the virtual linear. Um, is that particularly challenging to do with virtual linear? Um, the, the technology is, is that that you know it's it's there's no challenge in it whatsoever. Um, the challenge is actually from the outside broadcast, like it is with anywhere else, is, is getting the times right. Um, but the connections are you know, the fact that you rely on digital broadcasting, probably RTMP you know, feeds. They're exactly what broadcasts have been using for a, for a long time. Um, you know, the technology is robust. There's no challenge really. It's just making sure you're manning it, right? Someone's making sure it's, it's happening. Yeah. Ashwin, you don't see any challenges with that either? No, not, none, none, that, none that we're seeing at present. Um, so there's no problems with, you know, um, lag behind live or anything? I mean, not that I think would, would be material for us in considering uh, a new broadcast relationship, no. Does... You know, one of the interesting things about CTV is that I, I, I was in another session in the other, other theatre and Ian Nock made the point that quality now is actually better through digital delivery. Um, I'm watching a heck of a lot of 4K now that I wasn't before and I actually can't through any other platform. Is that a concern? You can actually deliver with higher quality on digital today. Is, is that something that's grabbing the attention of, of mainstream providers? I think so. I think, I think broadcasts, our, our top broadcasters, you know, our core broadcasters are always looking to provide the best experience. And so they're, they're looking at those technologies and looking at what's possible um, on, on their platforms. Um, I mean, for us, for F1 TV Pro, we're not available in 4K um, yet. Um, I think it's, it's probably on the roadmap, but I think we... Um, there's an awful lot on the, on the roadmap for a product still, you know, in year, year four of its development. Um, so we're still some way off. Skip 4K and come to us and go straight to 8K. <laughs> we can do 8K cloud encoding for you. <laughs> well, if we only had 8K now, TVs to watch it. <laughs> the latency will be an issue, but 
I, you know, when I ran the media business, the digital me business at Racing UK, we're delivering the digital quicker than we're delivering the satellite television feed. So it is an issue, and the, but the gambling world is obviously uh, the, is pushing latency on down on on all OTT because uh, they are able to. You know, you don't want people are betting in game to pictures, and they are well behind the actual result. So. The betting industry is forcing a lot of uh, people to look at their latency on uh, normal uh, uh, television distribution. I don't think latency is an issue. I think uh, the satellite is a very slow route um, and uh, digital will be much quicker than traditional methods of delivery. Betting does seem to have found a, a moment in digital, right? We have, um, there's a sports service in the States called Fubo TV, which is a virtual linear service. Um, pay TV in the United States is very marginally profitable. Um, this is a great way of, of boosting profitability, right? Investing in betting. This is something that Sky has done for, for years. Do we think that digital might uh, see that push forward even further? Uh, some people, well, I might say, you know, chasing the betting dollar is also at one level, the, uh, to paraphrase, the last refuse of a scoundrel in a way. But people do want to combine live sport with gambling. I think we have to be very careful. And if Fubo are pursuing a gambling route, I think, you might find that might have a lot more to do with the lack of success. I know their share price continues to defy belief given their revenues and their losses. Uh, but it, it, you know, it tells you more about the failures of the current business model um, that I think there. Um, so yeah, you know, does Zone want to wrap betting because it's part of the enjoyment of of, of sport and Skybet did own Skybet at, uh, at the time and Bet365 is a global phenomena for online gambling. Uh, but I don't think, uh, you know, I think it can be a red herring to the actual television and broadcast distribution world. So one of the things that came up earlier was young people, they want to watch uh, streamed and for the vast majority of premium sports today, they still can't and they won't be able to for some time. So I'm really under, I really like to, your opinion on what they should be doing if they're not going to provide their live games to reconnect with the younger audiences. Um, because they're, aren't they in danger of losing their future audience if they don't, if they don't reconnect with their younger with the younger audiences. So what do we think? Where sh how should we start? Ashwin, you have a very popular sport, um, most more popular with older people than with younger people. Is that right or not right? Uh, I think that's changed significantly over the past five years. I think now the interest pool is, um, I think the majority of the interest pool is under the age of 34, I believe, at this point. Um, so the, the demographics of the sport have changed, have changed significantly. Um, I, I think there are, there are probably Two, two points there. I think, firstly, we shouldn't be under the illusion that free-to-air necessarily means a wider demographic profile. Um, I think if you look in certain markets in, say, Central Europe, um, free-to-air viewing is primarily for older audiences as well. And actually, pay TV attracts a younger audience. Um, so there is a role, I think, for pay TV in introducing young audiences to sport. I think the investment that pay TV providers can also make in depth of coverage, and as I mentioned, in, in the wider content offering on, on free and social media, I think is really, is re has been very meaningful for us, in, for us in bringing new people to the sport um, in certain very big F1 markets in, in Europe, for instance. Um, I think the, the other point is, I think it is important, and, and you know, F1 has done a, a great job, I think, of um, building its, its social media profiles and following um, its digital platform. We now have the um, biggest motorsport platform in the world, news platform in the world. Um, we have the highest or the most engaged with social media platforms um, amongst premium sports properties in the world. Um, I think uh, you know, that's, that's taken time and investment over four years in building um, a sufficient volume of content, um, you know, the infrastructure internally to deliver 
um, for that audience. I think, that, I think that's really important uh, in terms of bringing, bringing audiences into the sport. But I think we also have to take a bit more of a holistic view about what sports brands are. Um, I think F1's revenue, like many sports properties, is diversifying very rapidly. TV is, um, has always been the biggest revenue driver and continues to be. Uh, but I think you know, there are some people who will be lifelong fans of the sport that will never watch a live broadcast. And we have to accept that and acknowledge that instead they might decide to, to buy an EA video game, or they might decide to, to buy some Topps cards, or you know, um, wear an F1 cap every week. And we have to accept that there are different ways of engaging with the property. Um, and you know, different, different media products we can provide, whether that's across social media, whether that's across Netflix or other um, general entertainment platforms, or whether that is you know, live broadcast through our, our broadcast partners, um, that can deliver for those fans in different ways. Yeah. Uh, Joe, you're free service, so there's literally no barrier. You're carrying live sport. Are you finding that the profile of viewers on your service is skewing younger, or is it, is it still older? It's difficult to say, to be honest with you, because, you know, quite frankly, we're non-registration, so the, the viewership data, or at least the demographic data, is led by the devices that we're on um, and the nature of the other services that are used on that device. Um, I take the point around free-to-air, at least by its traditional definition here, is an aged-up audience. But free-to-air from a streaming mentality, actually, you know, take out whether it's VOD or not, is aged down. I think the overarching point, and, and Pete talked about this previously, which is let's not make the decision on how they consume. We apply a principle of delivery. You mentioned this. We say it's satellite or streamed or vice versa. You know, we should just make it easy for a consumer to consume that piece of content by which their preference is um, and support those delivery means. Unfortunately, some of the deals that skew towards pay TV mean that they only have one means, right? But you know, Sky having a streaming device now opens the fold for that consumer to say, brilliant, I don't want to hold through the wall, I don't want the satellite on the house, I can stream. So I, think, I don't think actually it's to come, I think it's, it's happening now is you know, there are multiple options for someone to stream. Um, F1 is you know, a, a good example. Sky Broadcast, now TV. Like, you, know, you have the, the bouquet offering as it stands today. Yeah. Yep. Um, one thing that came up in Vidal's presentation earlier was the inflation in the cost of sports rights. Very clearly, digital has had an impact. Uh, folks like Disney and um, Amazon bidding on sports rights is pushing those rights up even higher, even if they don't win. Um, is this supportable in the long term? Simon? Well, I've sold a lot of sports rights and I've bought a few as well. And the market is telling certain rights owners that it's not supportable. That some of those are uh, geographic anomalies. Uh, French football being one. First of all, to have a vibrant sports market, you need to have competition and broadcasters in the market. Uh, so some rights are finding some, the great behemoth of NFL off on its 120 billion deal. They're not struggling. Some others, uh, the top end tier one, Serie A were lucky. They had a, they had a buyer in the market who had to double down on their rights. The zone had a smaller package, they had to double down. So there's lots of anomalies. In any market, you need competition. And sports rights and the trading of rights is no different. Some other rights owners are having to finesse their model. We look at Premiership Rugby, European Rugby. They're having to go for a terrestrial window. They're putting content while it's behind a paywall. They're also looking at some Channel 4 distribution for rugby. So. Uh, we've seen English cricket with the 100 go back on the BBC trying to attract. So to your, old, to your other question about the rights market, people are prepared to finesse their distribution where the money might come down a bit because of that model. Because their reach, go, reach goes up. Yeah, yeah, their reach goes up and they've got to market the sport, they've got to look after yeah. the sport, they've got to attract that younger audience. So people have to finesse that model as Formula One were doing in any sensible rights owner, you know, I've finessed the model for Football League, uh, the championship and the Football League clubs where 
the broadcast package is only 110 on Sky. What do you do with another 1,400, 1,500 games that weren't being distributed? You obviously digital fan base, how you finesse that. So rights owners have to finesse for the best for whatever their aim is, money or distribution. And, and that's very important. And then to your other point about children and digital, well, you know, it's, look at the price of what you need, you know. I'm a connected only now TV, multi-house, you know, Netflix, Amazon, Disney Plus coming in, you've got Paramount this, you've got Viaplay coming, you've got DAZN, you've got, uh, you add up the cost, what kid at 18, 19, what student has got 100, 120 pounds a month to spend on what in theory you need as your television content, presuming they then also need to buy a good old television license, which is going to be another 15, unless they own up to having a black and white one or something. But that, we are looking at hundreds of pounds, 1,500, 2,000 pounds a year in theory to be a legal viewer. So of course, it's not just that they want it on a digital device. Who has all of that? Yep. Who can afford to pay all of that? which is back to where we come, they started, of course they're going to steal it and they're going to pirate it because they have to finesse and manage their budget like anyone else. And everyone is under pressure. It, it's economics, supply and demand and cost and, and budget. And people can only rely on daddy's login subscriptions for too long at some point, you know. And Netflix are finding massive sharing problems and credentials, et cetera. So, there's a whole host of issues and uh, between all of those models and rights owners and stopping piracy and working out what you want to achieve, you've just got to do what you think is best for mm. your model and your commercial requirements. Um, we're, we're very near the end now, so if you have a question, get your hand up and we'll get, we'll get the we're microphone. The Pardon? We're past the end. <laughs> uh, no, I think we've still got a couple of minutes couple of minutes. So if you have a question, um, I, I want to just ask Ashwin and, and you, Joe, the same. Everyone same. wants a beer. <laughs> um, I, I want to ask you about uh, fragmented rights. Um, there's a lot of fragmentation of rights that I'm seeing among different platforms. This creates very difficult, makes it very difficult to find sports. Um, do you see fragmentation increasing because of digital pressures? I think it clearly it clearly is. I wouldn't say it's necessarily because of digital pressures. I think um, the, the equation is very different if you're a sport um, like the NBA, the NFL, the Premier League, where you have you know significant volume of, of matches, games um, to, to package up uh, in, into you know to, to, and, and sell to different broadcasters. I think you know at F1 we have 23 events this year. Um, it's very very hard to disaggregate those in any way. Um, so we don't fragment our rights in that way. Um, we, we are exclusive, typically, um, with a single broadcaster in, in the majority of our markets. Um, uh, but then, you know, yeah, look, look further afield, and, and certainly that's a, that, that, that is an issue, of course. Right, right. And when you go talking to the, more, more, the smaller sports, um, you, you accommodate if they had their own owned and operated site as well? Yeah, like I said earlier, we see ourselves as part of the mix yep. um, and a funnel fill for new audience. So you know, there, there seems no there's no point, point in us holding back an audience from going to a direct consumer proposition. Um, you know, if we had a price, we have a justification for retaining them. But as long as we've got a product that they'll come back for, you know, the price isn't a barrier. So um, no, we we do relatively. Uh, frequent deals with with partners that traffic an audience across platforms right I think one of the things if, if anything I, I've learned which is YouTube set the tone for a, a new generation of audience that you know, we had to respect they'll decide where and how they'll watch it yeah not us right and, yeah and, and that's the undertone of, of why piracy you know escalates in some cases is we can't be dictating it based on a deal that we've done or, or, or haven't done in driving a traf traffic to a single destination. Yeah. There is one other thing on fragmentation that rights owners often get a hard time for it, but also regulators in the European Union, they actually thought it was great for consumers to drive certain uh, separations and they actually have forced fragmentation believing it was in consumers' best interest. So it's not just rights owners who have chosen 
the filthy lucre sure. on fragmentation. Sure. In some cases, they're not allowed to Definitely. sell all their packages directly. They can only sell certain packages, etc. So, to, you can't always blame rights owners for having a fragmented model when it's been forced on them. Right. Ben Keane, quick, easy question for Ashwin. Ten-year time frame. Will Formula One still need any broadcast or streaming partners? Will you be going direct? Savage. Oh, no, absolutely, we will do. Absolutely, no, there's no question in 10 years' time. Um, yeah, I, overwhelmingly, yes. <laughs> five? Uh, yeah. Within five? Oh, no, what, sorry, within, within five? Or five? Sorry, to, to, be, no, to be clear, we will need broadcast partners, I think, oh, within 10 years. Yeah, yeah. I thought you were saying yeah. definitely you won't. No, no, we absolutely will. To be, yeah, to be absolutely clear, we, we absolutely will need, need partners within 10 years. His yeah. phone's going to be buzzing. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> completely direct. You, you don't think you will in 10 years' time? No, no. Why no. not? Uh, there's, there's a great deal of value in, you know, broadcasts are able to aggregate rights, to bundle value in a way that, that we can't, of course. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's an economics to bundling, I think, that drives more value for every constituent part of that bundle. And I think we've benefited from that significantly um, over, over the last, you know, 50 years. 70 years, um, and we'll continue to do so, I think, for, for many, many more years to come. Um, as I say, the, the owner-operator proposition for us is just serving a niche core audience um, that wants a little bit more than broadcasters can provide. I think in many cases, we will provide that um, in partnership with broadcasters. Um, you know, we'll be, we'll be super serving their fans, integrated into their products, um, you know, and, and I can't see that changing within 10, 15, 20, 30, well, I, I, can suggest, oh, I, can I can suggest one market that you will not be able to reach most of your audience within five years, and that's but through traditional, and that's probably the US. Uh, it, it depends how you define traditional. I think I, I would agree with, with Simon that I think um, you know, th these are all broadcasters, uh, whether ESPN broadcasts through digital, whether it's a, a, um, you know, an Amazon or an Apple yeah. or a Netflix or whoever it is. Um, they're just broadcasters and they're broadcast struggle. partners. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a pretty broad, broad definition of broadcaster. <laughs> and on that note, I think we should probably retire. I've got a feeling this conversation may go on over beer out, outside in the hall. Um, we've reached the end of the day. Please join us again tomorrow. We've got lots and lots of interesting stuff going on. And I will once again be closing out the day with you. So we'll see you tomorrow.